what is going on youtube it is pete coming in hot with another video also known as that guy pete you just refuse to invite to gatherings hope you are all doing well i certainly am um anyone who uh you know goes outside knows what happened today uh we got a certain uh former presidente going back to the white house which is pretty nice and uh, we also got majority on the Senate, and it looks like we're going to retain majority on the House. And we got majority in the Supreme Court still uh, with conservatives, so that's good. Um, we're hoping that keeping this on lock for two years might maybe allow for some changes. But hey, I'm kind of taking the position, let's just enjoy the breather from all the woke bullshit for a couple of years. And hopefully we can keep that momentum going and swing the pendulum back in the direction of conservatism. Uh, but that's going to involve men speaking up and not remaining silent in exchange for box. So we'll see where that goes. But yes, um, we definitely, as men, we came out and voted and uh, it actually worked out. So that's pretty good. We've averted disaster. So hopefully uh, things get good. We'll see in January, right, when it gets started. So why are we here today, though? We're here today, of course, to do a Q&A video. That's why we're present. So for those of you who are new here, what I do is I do a community post, usually like a week or so in advance. Um, sometimes I give less time depending on when I'm looking to do the video. Sometimes I give a little bit more, which I feel like I gave a little more this time. But I do a community post. You leave your questions. I start the video. I go from the oldest to the newest. I answer all the questions. I do not read the replies to the questions. And then I refresh before we conclude the video to see if there's any last minute you know, um, inquisitive souls that post a question, and then we conclude the video. And that's pretty much it, right? Pretty straightforward. Those of you who are not new here, you know the drill already. So without further ado, let's just dive right into these questions, uh, starting with Victor Ashul. Um, just said, hope you're great. World will go crazy in a few months, so take care. Um, yeah, I mean, whether or not the world will go crazy, uh, that really hinges on what kind of policies the Republican-dominated Congress, um, the Republican president, and so on, you know, work together to get passed. Uh, I'm anticipating tax cuts. I'm anticipating tariffs. Uh, definitely more hardline on immigration. And probably we're going to work out some sort of deal between Ukraine and Russia for sure. Iran is probably going to be a little bit more difficult to resolve, but um, it might be possible. Um, and then, of course, you know, just trying to like um, warm up relations with China a little bit before they get a similar idea to what Russia and Iran are doing. Um, so, yeah, if that fails, then yes, the world will go crazy in a few months, but hopefully it does not. We will see. Proud American, how you doing, Pete? Hypothetically speaking, if you were to become the absolute ruler, dictator of the USA for a period of eight years, no less and no more, how would you go about ruling the country? What would be your approach to economy and foreign policy? Well, the immigrants are all getting deported. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't give a shit. Like, if you're not here legally, you don't respect the laws, then there's a good chance that um, you're not really interested in going through the citizenship process and pledging your loyalty to my country. And because of that, uh, you're all getting deported. You're all getting deported, and if you come back, uh, I'm just going to throw you in jail. And, uh, you know, I'll keep you there for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and, again, this also depends on why they're in jail if they're just in jail because they hopped the border you know i'll probably keep them in there for a little bit and then send them back again um but if they commit like a violent crime like let's say they you know they murder a police officer or something then yeah death penalty like that would just be the end of it um because again if there is no consequences for the action you're incentivizing the bad behavior so you have to disincentivize Yes, there are countries like, you know, the UAE and Saudi Arabia where, let's say, you steal. They'll cut your hands off. Yeah, it's pretty freaking crazy, but is there a lot of theft? No, there isn't. So, unfortunately, to keep some people honest, it does require that. There's a good amount of decent people that don't require you to go that far to hold them accountable. Usually, a jail sentence will deter most people, um, but then you get those few that just don't care, um, and then you got to go the extra mile. 
Um, so there's that. Um, with the economy, I mean, listen, there is, you know, taxation for sure. Um, but tariffs probably isn't a bad way to make revenue. I'm kind of of the mindset, at least as I understand it, the, the mindset basically is, hey, if I make it too expensive for you to bring your shit into my country, but at the same time, I make it cheaper for you from both a tax perspective and a financial logistic perspective to just build your factory here and start fucking doing shit, then you're going to do that. And then you're going to create jobs in my country. And that's going to help out my people. Right. And then when I'm in a position where I can help other countries, then I consider helping other countries. But right now, you know, I got to help my own country first, which means tackling that debt. And to get that debt, we need income and we need a balanced budget. You know, I live my personal life. Don't spend more than you make. Simple as that. And that's why, you know, my credit score is, is over 800. Um, and, you know, I'm doing all right for myself financially because I don't spend more than I make. And you have to kind of apply that at a, you know, national scale. I understand that there is need for certain things, obviously. You know, you have to have a defense department when you got the rest of the world that wants to just like, you know, take over your country and ransack your resources. And believe me, if they felt that they had the military might to actually win, they might do it. So you have to constantly spend money on defense, of course. Um, but you also have to spend money on, um, on you know, the various programs so that obviously if people are paying taxes, they feel like they're actually getting some sort of service for what they're doing, not just defense, right? There are s several departments um, in the president's cabinet, you know, with various heads in the department, um, such as, you know, Department of Transportation, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, etc., etc. So you kind of have to make sure you have a system that works where everyone feels that they have a means to participate. But on the same token, if they do have a rough time, uh, we're not going to punish you and make it sink or swim. You know, we will fund programs that can help you out and get you back on your feet. But if you abuse the system, then obviously, you know, we'd have to kick you off those programs. You know, I would probably do things like drug tests for, for welfare, you know, shit like that. Because I don't want people abusing the system. I don't want fucking freeloaders, for sure. Um, so there has to be ways to screen for those. Uh, you know, what would those metrics look like that that would be important? You know, you probably have to talk to an advisor in the cabinet to figure that out. Um, but that stuff is very important. On foreign policy, you know, probably like let's say with Russia, I would probably just say, look, man. Um, we're kind of past the point where Ukraine can realistically get back Crimea and the Donbass region, okay? Um, I know what you're doing. You're sending in Russians to all these countries, and then you want the Russians to outnumber the natives so that it's like, hey, you know, we're pro-Russian, blah, blah, blah. And then slowly you overthrow the current government and replace it with a pro-Russian government. Still like Cold War era tactics. Um, my negotiation would just be something along the lines of, you know, that's got to stop. That shit's got to stop. Realistically, I can't see Crimea and Donbass going back to Ukraine, so Russia's going to keep that. But in exchange, they're going to have to give me something, something that benefits my people, um, whether that be, you know, some sort of, the, you know, um, some sort of preferential rates in trade, um, release of prisoners that are valuable to the United States, so basically high-profile assets, um, things like this. Um, we would have to ask for. Um, you know, I actually wouldn't be surprised if in the negotiation room, one of the things they'd ask for is give us Edward Snowden. I would not be surprised if they asked for that. But, you know, that's a whole nother talk. But again, very much like Capitol Hill or, um, you know, the White House or anything like this, politics is a game of you scratch my back, I scratch yours. So, you know, Putin's going to have to give us something of value. And then basically at the other end of it, basically the way I would approach it is, okay, we have a treaty in place. We have an agreement. If you pull an aid off and you break that treaty and you start, you know, doing like the Poland, Czechoslovakia jumps and invading and all that crap, or you go back on the agreement and you start invading Ukraine again, well, now you got a problem with us. So Ukraine's not part of NATO, but you have a problem with us. And that's it. Um, while on the um, 
the israel palestine thing i mean that's a really tough one because the people in palestine hamas in particular they like really believe like fervently that there is only one solution to this and that is a world without israel like point blank and the reality is we can't we can't have israel removed from the map because like it or not israel is a valuable intelligence source in the middle east without that we have no eyes in the region and that's my hypothesis on why the united states is so close with israel it's not all this fucking hey we believe in a jewish state and all that bullshit no it's there are valuable intel for the region so that we know what the hell's going on in the region and thus we could figure out how to assert our influence um so ending that war would be very very difficult in my opinion as far as i'm aware i don't think ben would listen to anybody um, and I can't really, you know, threaten him because if I do that, then I lose my intel source and then I don't have eyes there. So that's kind of, I think, why America's in a rock and a hard place. And that's why you see most politicians being pro-Israel because they understand the value of that intel and they can't just, you know, give that up. Sure, we could probably put our own assets in the region and have them spy, but that's probably far more risky than just having a sovereign state that's already established there doing the spying for you, so to speak. Um, you know, Iran in particular, you know, we gotta, we gotta get them bankrupt again, <laughs> you know, at least until they change their tune. If they change their tune and want to work with us, okay. But if they don't want to work with us, then again, we have to basically have it so that they do not have the resources to fund their proxies or build a nuclear weapon. Cause the minute they get a nuclear weapon, it's over. So definitely probably economic sanctions and things like that are going to play a role with Iran, unless they're willing to play ball. Um, China, again, we're kind of in a trade war with them, a lot of tariffs and things like this. We're hitting them with these tariffs so that basically our own products within the marketplace become more competitive. So that again, Americans are more inclined to buy American. Now you can argue, yes, that Americans are gonna pay more money for the American product than they would for the outsourced Chinese product where they're running basically sweatshops. I get that. You look at most items in your house, see how many you can find that say made in China on the bottom. I get all that. But here's the thing, right? Do you want your own people to be able to get jobs, right? So that they can be productive members of the economy instead of fucking freeloaders. Because the reality is that there is a lot of unskilled labor out there uh, that is ready, willing, and able. But again, the supply of jobs is just not there because it's so much cheaper to do it overseas so you have to engage in policy to make it more expensive for them to do it that way so that it basically forces their hand and now they're going to do it here in america because the current tariffs in place make it actually more cost effective to do it here right so you know there's like prices and things going up because of inflation and then there's situations like tariffs where you're using an actual tool um, to kind of have a similar effect to inflation where the costs go up so yes the argument is that the increase in price because the american product is going to be more expensive than the chinese product without tariff yes it is going to get passed to the consumer in that sense but the positive attached outcomes to that which is more jobs that is probably going to be in the eyes of the american people preferable to um, the status quo where there is no jobs and or the situation where the consumer would have to buy the Chinese product with the tariff. I'm just saying, tariffs work. If you're like building a big ass factory in Mexico and you want to bring stuff in through Mexico and the threat of tariffs makes them halt the construction of that factory, I'm just saying that there is something effective to that. Okay? It's not something that you should abuse. You know, it's not a cudgel, it's a tool, but it is something that definitely we can use to. Um, to leverage the raising of funds to pay off our debt. Um, yeah, so that that's obviously you know a big deal. Tariffs will help us raise funds. Um, <clears throat> taxes, on the other hand, the reality is that people are looking for the most cost-effective place to do business. So of course you have to have competitive corporate rates. The United States views most foreign companies by default as corporations which means that if they do business in the United States, they're subject to corporate income tax on the income 
that they generate within the United States as a foreign corporation. And, you know, what Trump wants to do is like, hey, the rate's currently 21%, but if you specifically are generating the income as a result of manufacturing within the United States, then we're going to give you a 15% tax rate. But this is under the condition that you actually get the factories built here, you manufacture the stuff here, and you create the jobs here. So basically, I'm giving you a tax incentive to do that. And I'm in agreement with that as well. I probably would do something similar. But um, again, in foreign policy, the three big players definitely are China, Iran, and Russia. North Korea is a smaller fourth player, but it's there. Um, and then probably on the other side of things, um, the West, I would probably pressure the European Union to stop with their authoritarian bullshit, like arresting people for what they post on social media. I think that's way out of pocket, gross government overreach. And, um, you know, as of the main superpower in the world, I would have the influence to be able to sort of apply pressure there and hopefully allow the people in Europe to have a little bit more freedom like they used to, right? Yeah, freedomhouse.org will tell you, oh, yeah, they're freer countries than us. They have a higher score on the Freedom Index. But if you can get locked up for posting on social media, how free are you really? You know, so there would be that as well. Well, on the economic side of things, um, yeah, you know, people want tax cuts or at the very least, they want more tax incentives um, that are going to allow us to engage in a more productive economy. Again, things like, for example, a lower tax rate for people who build factories and manufacture here. These are the kind of things um, that we want. And I think we've had things like that before. I think there was something called the DPAD deduction, do domestic production activities deduction or something like that. Um, you know, we need more of that. We want to incentivize people to do business here. Um, and sometimes the only way to do that is, okay, I can't undercut the prices that the other countries are charging, but I can make the tariff so high that it doesn't become cost effective. And it's like, fuck, I need to find another way. So yeah, you have to be pretty aggressive with the trade policy, um, which the trade representative in your cabinet would help advise you on that. Um, and then also on the foreign policy, you have to stand firm. Like you can make deals with these people, but you got to make it clear. Like if you go back on your word, uh, we're going to have a real problem, and it's not just going to be words, right? And any foreign leader who's a man understands what that means. So yeah, I mean, probably yeah, a strong, um, you know, relatively aggressive, but not overly aggressive, but aggressive enough that they get the message. That's kind of how you have to run things. And then back home, like I said, you got to get rid of those illegal immigrants. You know, the illegal immigrants getting to squ squat in hotels is an insult to the legal immigrants who actually did it the right way. They should be more infuriated than anyone else. Um, ELCHDA. Okay. I am facing insomnia and health issues and facing the discrimination and hatred due to not being able to put on a happy, go lucky, love bombing, positive, lively persona. This discrimination includes rejection from employment. Yeah, we call that, there's actually a term, toxic positivity where it's like um, optimism to the point where it's like a detriment. It's like, a, again, we have there's actually a mental illness where like you're happy all the time. It's called mania, right? Um, it's not natural. It's natural to have a normal range of emotions. So I would definitely be curious if um, your emotional disposition is something more akin to depression and anxiety. If you feel like that all the time, uh, that definitely could drag people down. It's okay to have bouts of sadness and bouts of, you know, anxiousness, but to be like that all the time, that's what's going to really um, put off a um, averagely adjusted person, psychologically speaking. Um, but on the flip side, I think over the top, you know, optimism, toxic positivity is equally bad because it's like you're coping, you're bullshitting yourself. Uh, it's better just to be more honest about these types of things and, and talk them out. I understand in a job interview, um, that's not really the place. So usually in the job interview, uh, for good or ill, um, you kind of have to put that, those feelings on the back burner. People are more accepting of the negative stuff once they've known you for a while and they've built that rapport with you. But if they don't know you from a hole in the wall, yeah, it's going to put them off. Just sounding tired is enough to be vilified. Uh, this crap is getting to me because I do not even know how to fake the positive vibe I am expected to give off. 
faking is a skill faking is a skill um but you have to sort of try to see the good in things you know that's difficult to do especially again if you're depressed and anxious but um you know it might not just be that there might be other underlying things you need to confront you know and i always encourage people to confront whatever the underlying causes of their you know feelings might be so that they can process it accept it and then be okay with it and then that kind of frees up some uh bandwidth in your mind to uh to express other emotions besides negative ones um but yeah anything to society anyone that is not smiling fool extrovert or a manipulative narcissist or psychopath deserves to starve to death while people in authority making life awful are deified a psychopath feels nothing when seeing someone suffering but most neurotypicals hate men that are suffering uh legitimately pro-social empathetic people are very rare Mm -hmm. being a good utility is not enough we must also be gestures how irritating um yes so unfortunately this is women in particular they do look at men as sort of um not just success objects that have to provide but like some sort of source of entertainment right yeah that's very common um so in that situation i probably just would not engage with women if that's kind of what you're dealing with um because the reality is we've talked about this before the empathy gap where women they just they struggle to empathize and see men as human they really do struggle with this um it's a little bit easier if it's like their brother their son their father or you know occasionally their husband if you got a good one but for the most part the average man they do not empathize with them the same way that an average man might empathize with a woman um that they do not know so yes that is really annoying and when you look at the elite whether it's you know the political elite the military elite the corporate elite and how those all get together with like the real secret guys in the shadows and the intelligence community a lot of these people are definitely narcissistic they're machiavellian they're psychopathic um and also they are i would say um that they're kind of charlatans they think like they have like this special knowledge that nobody else knows and it makes them feel like ooh, you know i'm very important um yeah elites are definitely full of their own shit i think the election made that loud and clear uh the people are just like yo fuck this um <clears throat> but uh, that's not going to change the way people perceive things overnight um but yes what's going on low iq normies hate anyone that makes them feel bad because it collapses the fair world fallacy and ego or subclinical narcissism or dominance hierarchy shenanigans um so there definitely are people predominantly women um that don't like you making them look bad right so if you start saying things <laughs> that make them look like assholes of course they're going to react with hostility because they rarely are held accountable in their lives um men you could probably talk it out a little bit more um usually the more intelligent men that are more uh, introspective are open-minded but even normie men you'd be surprised what kind of conversation you can have with them um but yes also there there is also a dominance hierarchy where people who are more pro-social like at least they give off the impression of pro-social they tend to be higher up because we're a pro-social species the danger though is that psychopaths are really good actors so they can really put off the look of being pro-social but deep down they feel jack shit um so that's why they're particularly dangerous and they climb those hierarchies but to answer that question it's a little bit of both but how can i fool these people when the need arises especially in interview context and similar context so i do not give away the fact i am struggling male aka low status um well usually in the job interview right i don't really focus on my personality what i focus on is my ability to do the job can i do the job so i would focus on things like okay am i the kind of person that takes responsibility for the decisions that he makes whether it's in a professional context or otherwise yes i own my work i take responsibility for it um do i have the potential to take initiative in a situation like if i see something wrong in the workload will i just kind of go in and fix it without being asked okay so you know um takes takes responsibility has initiative these are kind of the key words that they're looking for so if you say those kinds of things 
um, you're more likely to um, peak their interest versus just kind of giving them the boilerplate. Well, I went to college and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, you and everybody else. Um, they're looking for certain like moral character traits. And you'll notice that being depressed or anxious is not a moral, moral character trait. When they ask you, what's your weakness? Sometimes I push myself too hard. Um, but I only do that because I really want to do the job and I want to do it well. Um, that would be an example of how you address what's your weakness. Well, what's your strength? I take responsibility for things. Um, you know, I actually give things a lot of thought. I critically think. And, you know, I take initiative. I'm always looking to jump on it and solve the problem. These are the kind of things that they're looking for. So you kind of have to, like, um, you know, not so much hone in on, like, the emotional aspects of things and just sort of look at, like, what you can do. So don't focus on feelings, focus on what you can do and showcase what you can do and that will allow you to perform better in job interviews, right? This definitely um, helped for me when I worked in sales. It helped a lot because sales, think about it, right? When you're engaged in sales, what are you trying to do? You're trying to sell a product or service. So what do you have to do? You have to highlight all the pros of having this service or product, how it benefits you, how you can match that product to the needs right so you have to be mindful of what the you know interviewer needs right the job description those are their needs so you should be tailoring your answers to kind of match those needs but something like oh i take responsibility for things um you know i take initiative i'm always looking to learn new stuff blah 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 blah. these are kind of things that you could apply pretty much universally to most fields they'll just like okay this guy's a go-getter there's someone that i can actually kind of break in and turn them into a professional given enough time all right, this is someone that I, I can invest in. So again, just to reiterate in closing, because I now, now it's like we're in kind of word salad territory, and I didn't mean to do that. Um, don't try to be someone you're not. You know, Don't try to do that toxic positivity bullshit. Um, but at the same time, don't tip your hand and reveal that you know, you're somebody that you know, thinks that the world's a fucked up place. Because to be honest, I think the same exact thing you do. I do. But, you know, at the same time, I can hone in on what I'm good at and present that. And I think that's what you have to do. So you really need to, like, sit down. Sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and really think about, like, what skills you have. What are you good at? What personality traits do you think they look for in an effective worker? And focus on those and make showcasing that the core of your answers when you answer these questions. And whenever someone asks you what your weakness is, you have to just say, point blank, you know, sometimes I push myself really hard because I do take initiative. I do, you know, do all these things. And sometimes, you know, because I want to I wanna get it right, I'm kind of a perfectionist, that can sometimes work against me. But for the most part, it actually works in my favor or something like that. And you'll probably have an easier time. Hope that helps. Okay, next we got KJ Ghost. Hey, Pete, I know you don't do book reviews anymore, but I really hope you'll do a surgical takedown on Wheat Waffle's new book, The Black Pill Bible. Your take would be epic i did hear about this book actually um so i i actually after i read your comments i totally forgot i did it actually but i did end up just getting it it's in it's the, the pdf file is in my fucking gmail somewhere so let me just pull it up i'm not going to do the whole book obviously but um i want to just kind of go over the 10 commandments really quick i'll at least do you a solid on um on that so let me just quickly, or try to quickly, if it lets me. Okay, it does let me. Great. So let's go ahead and just very, very quickly go through these Ten Commandments. Because um, there's ten of them, right? So, um, where the hell? Okay. So the first one is that the monopolization of dating by the top percent of men. So this is pretty true on dating apps specifically. When you go outside, I would say probably like the top half of men are, you know, able to get something, right? Because we always say that in the the looks test, the basic looks test, it's probably somewhere around like a 4 out of 10, normie light, I call it. That basically means that if you're at least passing the looks test, your non-physical attributes, like your vibe, will actually... Um, amplify your overall attractiveness factor your smv if you will as well as potentially your rmv your relationship market value um, but if you don't pass that looks test it's kind of a moot point 
But if we're talking raw SMV for the purposes of just getting laid, no commitment, nothing like that, of course, when you get on a dating app, which is basically an ooga booga digital playground, the top 10%, of course, the best of the best looking men are the ones that are going to get most of the play because the objective is sex. But when you go outside into the real world, touch grass, as they say, Again, if you have any non-physical attributes to kind of amplify it, like you know how to carry a conversation and stuff like this, you start seeing like more like 30 to 40% are, uh, are getting play. So I wouldn't say the dating market in its entirety is monopolized. However, dating apps in particular, oh yeah, there definitely is a handful of men kind of raking it in, if you will. Okay, so what else do we have here? Trying to locate the second commandment. Yeah, he just kind of like really, he really goes into detail, and like I I respect that. Um, but I'm not gonna lie, as I was trying to read it, it, I just felt like I was like going through deja vu, reliving a lot of the stuff that I've been posting in my channel for the past few years. So um, yeah, like he talked about all the features that make an attractive face, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, how to take correct pictures versus how to take incorrect pictures all that stuff all valid of course especially when you're doing a dating profile because people don't know you from a damn hole in the wall so all they got to go on is pictures naturally speaking so of course that's going to be um, an issue the second commandment is uh, the looks black pill right so basically how the majority of non good looking men are redundant in today's dating market and how dating for modern men has more or less become a matter of be attractive or starve Simplified reasons for why this is the case are online dating has increased superficiality to the point of 90% of men's attractiveness is their looks alone. So I believe that looks has always been number one, but online dating as well as social media has indeed um, put this on steroids for sure. And in the animal kingdom during times of abundance, the importance of sexual selection looks becomes more important for male reproductive success than natural selection humans have the most abundance of any species on the planet um yeah so basically what he's saying is as populations swell there's more competition so it gets more fierce for the average man and that definitely is what's happening so i don't really disagree with commandment number two it's pretty fair the online has definitely made people more superficial and thus has made it much more difficult to be deemed physically attractive as a man and also because there's just so many options, which again, social media amplifies this. We are in a position where, again, the competition is so fierce, it makes it very, very difficult to be reproductively successful. So by and large, I don't really disagree with commandment number two, though I do push back a little bit on commandment number one. Okay, number three is the male replaceability black pill. The third commandment is about how even if you luck out and find a girlfriend, she'll likely develop a false sense of your replaceability. Yes, I say this all the time, no matter what, a girl can change her mind at any time. She's like the wind. And the reason why women tend to change their minds more than men do is because one, they have lower libidos and therefore they do not want men as much as men want women. Therefore, women have more options than men by default. And as a result of this, they move as they do. So he does point this out. Women always have more options than men, irrespective of whether she's in a relationship or not. Asymmetry of information means it's impossible for women to know if the offers she receives from men are genuine or pump and dump motives, which that forces her to have to be more picky. And coinciding with the first point, many men don't give two shits about whether a woman is in a relationship or not. That is, if she makes an offer, most men will probably home wreck. Um, I wouldn't say most, but maybe like a good chunk would. Okay, so I don't really disagree with this commandment either. Again, it's pretty much valid. Um, then there's fourth commandment, which is the online dating black pill. So basically, it's being pushed as the default dating mechanism for pairing couples. And this is true. Uh, couples are definitely meeting primarily online more than anything else. It used to be warm approach where you met through mutual friends. But now online dating is definitely becoming number one, especially in an increasingly atomized world. It's making it much more difficult for us to get to know each other. It's making us less trusting of each other because I think a lot of women in particular have bad experiences with hookup culture. And then they have apex fallacy. They, you know, they bang a few chads and then they think all men are like that, you know. So feminism has increasingly stepped in to say it's harassment for women to be approached by men, 
only ugly ones. I agree with this. Whether or not it's harassment hinges entirely on if she finds you attractive. Just 15 years ago, online dating was seen as the pairing mechanism for losers. Basically, if you couldn't like do well talking in person, you went online where it was a little bit easier. But it's completely reversed now, where again, to meet someone interesting, you probably have to go outside and touch grass. Um, but now it seems like the, the going outside and touching grass is becoming the oasis, when it used to be the other way around, where outside in person, people rejected you left and right, and you know you had to go online. Uh, but women have greater priorities during their daytime than to be meeting guys, of course, because they think they have all the options in the world and those options are always going to be there. And as a result of that, they don't really have to spend a lot of time chasing dudes. The dudes come to them and their phones in particular do make them addicted to attention. Yeah. Unprecedented illegal immigration is bringing a lot of undesirable and predatory men into cities, creating a negative stigma for cold approach because women don't want to be approached by predatory foreigners. This is definitely more true in Europe, for sure, which is where he's from. He's from the UK. Um, but again, had Trump not got elected, that problem could have eventually become a real thing here. So I would say true for Europe on that, less so for us. Increased car culture and Amazon culture means the opportunities to cold approach are lower than they have ever been. Um, I'm not really sure what car culture and Amazon culture means, um, but you know, just in general, the internet has made cold approach less of an attractive prospect for meeting women. The fifth commandment is the ready to settle and low quality women black pill. Right, this is the cock carousel, pumped and dumped repeatedly. I'm ready to settle down now with the roast beef meme. That's what this is. And the main reasons are the way society is structured today means women in their 20s pretty much need men like fish need a bicycle. This is a feminist teaching and surprisingly it's becoming more and more true. Basically, they're like, we don't need no men, right? Until they want to get married and have kids, then they need us. The barriers to entry for LTRs have increased at the same time the barriers for STRs have decreased. This is for a multitude of reasons. Right. So basically, again, especially when they're younger, Women are basically looking for STRs with Chad. They're not really looking for long-term relationships with, you know, the good guy, right? Uh, dating apps are the most efficient tool for Chads to facilitate pump and dump. Absolutely true. Um, therefore, many pure women end up becoming damaged unintentionally because they were anticipating a relationship with Chad, but instead got pumped and dumped. This is a tale as old as time. It feeds into the vicious cycle. Absolutely. Many women choose poor lifestyle habits um an edgy lifestyle and yes you know usually if you have one bad habit it's going to lead to another uh, but every woman you speak to if she's attractive and above 21 will have some form of dating history yes so unfortunately the reality is that um college um college educated women again especially ones that go away to college there's a lot of opportunity for for sex and things like this so that again decreases the uh, marriageability of of an increasing number of women, which is problematic, of course. So I by and large agree with commandment number five. Don't really have any problems there. Um, if we get to commandment number six, the decline of social capital black pill. Okay, so the idea here is that the sixth commandment is about the decline of social capital. If you were thinking of relying on warm approach to meet your special someone, then think again. Right, because more people meet online than ever before. So warm approach, while still potentially could be effective, it's not nearly as effective as it used to be. Society's never been more isolated and segregated by gender. Please see the voting. All the women voted for Kamala. All the dudes voted for Trump. For the most part, everywhere you go, there are swaths of men and hardly any attractive young women. A lot of women don't leave their house nowadays besides going to work. And since most workplaces are segregated by gender, it hardly means you'll have much luck there either. So yeah, the um, the gender the gender data seems to suggest again that there's very specific fields that both the men and women go into so the workforce isn't really as integrated um, as perhaps we would like so there's not really a lot of opportunity to talk shop with girls and then one thing leads to another that sort of thing so his argument is like hey if you think you could just build rapport and warm approach this it's going to be difficult. I agree with that, but I don't agree with the idea that it's impossible. Um, so there's a little pushback on commandment number six. 
Um, so far, I've only pushed back on one in six. Seven, dating demographics are worse than ever for men. Men aren't dying in battles wars as much as they used to. Men aren't killing themselves in stupid ways as much as they used to. Birth rates have collapsed in the West, leaving stiff competition for the few fertile young women that are left. Immigration, especially illegal, and surprisingly, this is worse for ethnic men than whites. Um, yeah. So basically, what's happening here is that because what traditionally used to happen is a lot of men died in wars and things like this, birth rates used to be more abundant immigration really wasn't like a thing like to the degree it is today especially the illegal kind so this is like diluting the dating market and making the competition even more fierce because of this men's prospects are pretty rough because there are more men than women in society and because there's more men than women again poly polyandry doesn't work right so you can't have multiple men doing women i mean unless they're like desperate simps but generally speaking, yeah, the dem dating demographics are getting worse, especially for men, because men are outnumbering women. Probably the most pronounced iteration of this issue is in China because of the one-child policy. Okay, so that's number seven. Um, yeah, I know I'm going through it fast, but, you know, I can't, like, spend the whole video on it. I'm doing the best I can, though. Um, number eight. Let's see what we got here. The political divide pill. So the eighth commandment is how in Western nations, the political views among the youth are becoming separated by gender. Yes, women are becoming increasingly leftist because for their shitty views and feelings, they don't have to go to war for them. So if you don't have to sacrifice your life for your crappy views, of course, you can have views on whatever the hell you want. But men understand as they age that, no, conservatism is kind of the way you have to go. Because um, you have a lot to lose if you try to walk around in your ivory tower with luxury beliefs. So usually it's people in ivory towers and women who live life on Tutorial Island. Those are the people that can afford to have like you know those out there left-leaning beliefs. And the issue in dating is one of the things you have to do is you have to have common values. But if it's more difficult to find a conservative woman... Of course, there is the political divide, and that makes dating even more difficult. So it seems the case that Wheat Waffles is trying to make here as he's going through these commandments is that there's a lot of shit, not entirely your fault or probably not even your fault at all, to be honest. Just a lot of environmental factors that you fortnighted into. You were born at the wrong time that really influence the dating odds in a negative way it doesn't make it impossible it just makes it f a lot more improbable which is pretty consistent with what i've talked about over the years the ninth commandment is about wealth so the idea is that increases in wealth have consistently outpaced wage growth in the last 40 years meaning generational wealth is becoming increasingly important compared to income when attracting mates um, the low birth rate means inheritance becomes more concentrated, being shared with one to two children instead of three to four, meaning it's going to be a huge factor for owning property and living in better areas if your parents had invested in those years before. Yes, the World Economic Forum, you'll own nothing and be happy kind of shit. And then you have society just being very racially segregated. I can vouch for this in Brooklyn. Um, I live in a pretty mixed neighborhood, but for the most part, neighborhoods are not like mine it's like here's the italians here's the jews here's the russians here's the hispanics here's the this here's the that that's usually how it goes um and it's a result of wealth disparities and it's also a matter of culture um people like to like familiarity so they like to be around people that think like them have similar belief systems as them were brought up in a similar upbringing as them etc etc but um yeah there is definitely this as well so again one of the things women look for is of course a provider and of course they want the best provider that they can get so of course that wealth division is going to make it even harder for the men who aren't at the upper end of that wealth division um, to find mates which of course is problematic so so far i mean everything he said here is um uh, is pretty true at least the the general statement i'm sure as he gets into the nuance and unpacks this stuff there might be things we disagree on but at the core idea i think most people in the black pill space agree on these types of things like these things matter like big time and of course making it more difficult to attain these things or being much more harsh in the grading metrics on these things um it's going to make dating more difficult for men so the final commandment of this book is the solution to everything. So I guess this is his solution. In spite of how rigged dating is against men, which clearly it's rigged, look at it, 
but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think like anyone intentionally did this. I just think the environment cultivated this. But um, how can you still navigate, find a high quality girlfriend for an LTR, have lots of casual sex with women, spin plates? You pick one or the other. Uh, with no bullshit, the solution to obtaining either of these things is the same. Looks, social skills, and exposure. This I do not disagree with at all. Okay? So looks, you have to pass the looks test. If you do not pass the looks test, you nothing else matters. Second, vibe check. You could have you know, provision ability. You could have leadership in all these things. But you, if you don't have the ability to communicate that, very similar to the last guy who asked the question about the job interview, there's a, there's a demand there and you got to match that with a supply. But if you can't match what you're offering to those needs in some way, shape, or form, I'm not saying like, hey, here's my checklist and here's what I offer. I'm not saying it like that. But in the course of conversation, these kind of things are going to come up. You have to be able to communicate that and articulate that effectively. And lastly is exposure. Location, location, location. If you don't expose yourself, well, I always say this, go to places that showcase your interests and see what you can find. Um, then, yeah, that that's not going to help you. you. You have to have exposure. You have to be able to communicate. And you have to look good. Um, I don't really disagree with that. We've talked about that at length as well. So just taking a quick look at that PDF apologies to everyone else who felt like that was dragged out um i do agree with most of what he says in the book at least on the face um you know i push back a little bit on the warm approach effectiveness i push back a little bit on um you know commandment number one but for the most part just quick glance at the book um i do agree with most of what wheat waffle says but probably not everything if i really dissected it we just don't have the time to do that right now um, Gallo Sengen says, sell me why I should buy Refantasio when Atlas will re-release it another two times <laughs> in the next five years. If it's that good, I'll entertain it. I think Refantasio was a type of game. It was just some sort of IP they were working on and nobody expected it to be as good as it was. It kind of felt like medieval fantasy Persona. So if you liked Persona 5, let's say, then you'll probably like this game. It's a very enjoyable game. Um, so for me personally, um, it had good gameplay, uh, the characters were cool, the premise of the story was entertaining, the lore was very interesting, like I really felt I was playing a fantasy RPG, kind of not unlike, you know, the Western RPGs that I play where there's a codex, there's information, um, but you know, there's bonds like in Persona, there's bonds here, um, you know, you could level up your what's called archetypes which is basically their version of personas um there's some nods to other megami tensei titles in here uh in the naming conventions and stuff but you know i really enjoyed the plot i i thought it was really cool uh basically i'll give you a quick premise um the king of the land is murdered that's just the opening so whatever the king of the land is murdered uh his son the prince is cursed and nobody knows he's still alive but the same person who killed the king arranged to have this guy cursed or he was framed to have this guy cursed whatever doesn't matter and basically now they need to figure out okay who's going to succeed the king and what the king arranged is a competition where basically the winner of the competition gets to reach the throne and become king basically instead of hereditary you know succession anybody could be king and your job basically is to to win this tournament and and build the case and you're going to travel all around the kingdom as you're doing this so like i said it was pretty um entertaining for me um i'm not sure if they're going to do a re-release of it they might again it's a new ip they might not um it just depends um, but if they do, then yes, you probably want to wait. But I think the game is worth playing, and I definitely do not regret my purchase. Um, I think it was, again, it was just an I, a new IP out of left field. Nobody was really expecting much of it, but then it turned out to just be a really good game. A lot of fun. Western Studios can definitely take a page out of that book, for sure. But I can't make you buy it. But I can just tell you from my experience, I thoroughly enjoyed the game. The Darkest Night, it's over. Yep, still holding that stance, I see. How do you come to terms with being a failure in life like me? That's my question. Well, again, 
I always look at it like this. If I feel I'm in a position of failure, the first thing I always do, and I know you're probably going to roll your eyes at this, is locus of control. That's always the first question you have to ask. How much of this a failure is attributable to internal locus of control factors? And how much of it is external locus of control factors? Okay? Because if it's external, like, again, coming to terms, the answer is in the question. You have to accept that there's absolutely nothing you can do about this, so there's no point beating yourself up over it, right? You can't do anything about it. You can't choose who your parents are. You can't choose where you fortnighted into and popped out. You can't choose any of that, right? So you can't really get too bent out of shape about that. But then there are things in your genetic wheelhouse that allow you to do certain things and not, and you know when you assess where you're at, you know what you can and cannot do, right? So the internal locus of control stuff, you have to ask yourself, all right, am I doing everything I can to optimize these metrics that are in the internal locus control category? And if the answer is yes, okay, I'm doing everything I can on those fronts, and I've accepted everything I can't control, that's really the only way you're going to find peace. Because again, feeling like shit about it implies that you think there's a scenario where you could have control over the external locus factors. You know, that's what I think really does the negative emotion. There's like an internal beating yourself up thinking, there's something I can do about this. But you're not going to be able to let it go if you can't actually accept that there's nothing you can do about it. If it's external locus. Right? While internal locus stuff, it's like, okay, this is clearly something I can do something about, and I'm just not doing something about it. So that's something I need to fix, right? So, you know, an example of this might be something like, hey, you know, I, I feel like shit because let's say I, I'm going for, for um, a credential like the CPA, let's say, and I feel like shit because, you know, I can't pass the test, Right? Now, if the external factor is basically like, hey, now they're just not offering the test anymore, and I only had until this date, that's it, no more test, that's an external locus of control factor. I can't beat myself up over the fact that the test is no longer being offered because that's an external locus of control factor, but maybe I didn't study hard enough. That could be an internal locus of control factor because I can always go back and study more and try again. That's something that I can do. I can go and pick up that book and study. Um, so, you know, most of the time, I think what ends up happening in the black pill space is people really do try. They come from the red pill space where they actually did everything that they could do. They did the internal locus factor thing, and then they get hit with the external stuff. They're like, fuck, I can't do anything about my height. I can't do anything about this, that, and the third. And that's hard for a lot of people to accept. And then the nihilism sets in. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't get out and they conclude that it's over. That's what they conclude. But again, you just have to accept that there are certain things you have no control over, and therefore you should not be trying to take responsibility for it via beating yourself up and feeling like shit about it. There's nothing you could do. Silverback Wamahu, hello Pete. Do you remember your watershed moment when it comes to black pill? And if you could describe the moment, what was it like? 2021 is when I really started kind of diving into the black pill. Um, I think the whole genetic determinism thing, when that kind of clicked, um, the, the genetic environmental mix, <clears throat> you know, that kind of made me realize some things and it made it a little bit easier to accept what I could and could not control. But, you know, once I started thinking about, um, you know, how, for example, short people behaved around me, like I had a short coworker, um, how they behaved around me, um, and of course, you know, very like trying to like put me down and things like this. It made me realize how important things like height and looks are. Uh, because So much so that if other people see that you're tall, they might want to like cut you down a few pegs um, to make themselves feel better. So it was situations like that that just sort of made me realize, wow, looks is so pervasive and it really influences other people's behavior, whether they see you as a threat, whether they see you as a friend or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I would say, you know, those were the kind of moments that I had at work um, that really woke me up to it. Um, but it wasn't like it happened in real time and then boom. It was more like ruminating and reflecting on it, you know, at, when the pandemic was happening and I had free time on my hands. <clears throat> That's kind of where it hit for me when I started really thinking about those social interactions and why they played out the way they did. 
And then I just from there started looking into it more. And then as I kept digging, it made more and more sense. Noble Six says, hello, Pete. I'm 28 years old with secondary school diploma, high school, and training as an industrial clerk. Nice. Been living in the States for the last 10 years, and I'm honestly tired of my current job. Many times I've thought about quitting and starting over somehow, but the fear of taking the wrong path and leaving my comfort zone has always stopped me. I've been living like a hermit without any real social circle or role models. I don't even have any goals anymore. Since learning about the red pill perspective, especially seeing how men and women relate and choose each other, I've lost a lot of motivation to start anything new. But despite this, there's still a part of me that wants to turn things around and make it out of this rut. I feel the pressure of time slipping by, which is partly fueled by comparing myself to others. There was a time when I was ambitious, striving for the best grades I could achieve. But ever since my red pill awakening, which stemmed from an experience with a woman, I feel like I've fallen into a nihilistic valley. This red pill malaise. It's shaking me to my core and I don't feel good about where I am. Very familiar. But again, very much like I just told Darkest Night, again, you have to accept that probably some of those things, yes, were under your control, but now you're aware of what those things are and what you have to do to avoid those pitfalls again. But secondly, you're now also aware of the external that you do not have control over. And those are the things that you kind of have to let go. Is it really like this? Like it's so fucked up that women are like this? <coughs> Unfortunately, it is what it is. But it was like that before you figured this out too. And it's going to continue being like that. And you were totally fine before you figured it out. So again, you just have to sort of accept that other people are an external factor. There's nothing you can do about them. And you got to accept that. Now, of course, you know, it's not too late. It's never too late. Um, honestly, you can always chart a new course if that's what you want to do. Yes, of course, there's always risk in doing that. But... Um, in terms of AI technology and stuff, of course, that's always a risk. Um, you know, generally speaking, if you're just looking for the safe job, I do recommend things like accountant, doctor, lawyer, things where you really have to have a lot of know-how. Um, those things tend to be relatively safe jobs because you're always going to need that. Um, there's not going to be AI arguing in a courtroom in front of a judge anytime soon, for example. But you live alone. You don't have a safety net. I have about 50,000 euros in savings. That's not bad for age 28. It's a decent amount here in Germany, but not life-changing. No, definitely not. You have to keep saving. But what would you do in my place as a 28-year-old who feels like a lost cause? If you want my honest opinion, my honest opinion as a risk-averse person is I always play it safe, which means probably in your position. I can't speak of if this is what's best for you. But there are times when I don't like my job, and there are times when I do like my job. But for the most part, I tough it out and I keep making money. As long as I'm making a decent wage, I'll tough it out, especially if I'm good at it. I've said this before. You don't have to love your job. It's great if you do, but you don't have to love your job. But you have to be good at it so that when you do it, it doesn't feel like just endless agony. You know, It might be difficult for some the next guy to do it, but you, it's not because you're good at it. So that's very important, being good at your job. So in your shoes, I probably would be the one to stay at the job if being an industrial clerk is something that you are good at and effective at and there's room for growth. You can keep getting promoted and making more money. That's probably what I would do. However, if you are really passionate about something else, then the question becomes, okay, are you prepared to make the switch over knowing that, hey, maybe it's not a guarantee that that growth is there. I tend to go towards the safer option. That's just me. But if there is safety in working in, you know, IT programming and things like this, then I would say, hey, you know, you still have time. You could at least go to school part time and get that credential, you know, whatever you need. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a, mount, it's a matter of are you willing to invest the time, the money, and the energy to do it? Um, or are you totally okay with continuing to make money as an industrial clerk and contributing the excess of your expenses to this, this uh, $50,000 euro or 50,000 euro safety net and letting it grow? Um, but yes, the red pill moment thing, it definitely fucks a lot of people up because we're hardwired to want to protect and provide. That's the main reason why we go out and work so we can provide and for our family and stuff. So when you find out the how women fucking figure all this shit out and decide who they're going to have a family with, 
it kind of demotivates you because you're like, wow, my odds of getting that in 2024 is so low. So I have no family or anything to work for. So you only have yourself to work for. So the idea that you want to work less makes sense because you only got one person to provide for yourself. But again, the question is with your current job, can you live comfortably with that job? Um, and if you can, do you want to rock the boat on that? Or do you really think switching over to this other job potentially is going to be more lucrative and sustainable? Right? So you kind of have to look at the sustainability of both jobs. You have to look at the growth potential of both jobs and so on and weigh these metrics and figure out, okay, will I really be happier at this new job? Or is it going to be the same thing where eventually I'm going to get tired of that job too and want a new one? Um, you know. The grass always looks greener on the other side, I guess is what I'm saying. So there is no straight answer to this, but I can say in your shoes, I probably would keep the safe job um, and just keep making the money. That's probably what I would do. <coughs> but that doesn't mean that that's going to sit right with you. Okay, H-R-A-F-N-K Olbrander says, Hey Pete, we see a great deal of content in these spaces related to women cheating. Yes, why they cheat, how they cheat. But on the other side of a woman who cheats is a guy who enabled it. Interesting. And most probably knew she was with somebody already. If you knew she was with somebody and um, you let it happen anyway, you do not respect yourself as a man and you get what you deserve. Um, so I guess what I would say to that is if you are a guy who knew you let it happen and now you're bitching about it because you touched the stove and you burnt your hand, you're bitching about your burnt hand, I don't feel sorry for you. And I'd be like, yeah, it's your own damn fault. You should have fucking asked questions when you first saw the signs so you could check out with what little self-respect you have left. Why is it that I see so little content devoted to these guys who contrary to popular belief aren't always and rather usually aren't chats? Um, these days, if a girl is interested in me and she has a boyfriend, that is a hard no for me. I'm the same way. If a girl's in a relationship and I know it, I would be like, no, I'm going to respect the relationship because I'm not an asshole. But what I often see is an attitude of, well, it may as well be me because if it wasn't, it would just be some other guy. Yeah, it's the same shit with, uh, you know, people who, who steal, people who lie. Well, if it isn't, if it isn't, you know gonna be me it's gonna be someone else so therefore i'm justified no other people doing bad shit does not justify you doing bad shit yeah argumentum ad populum right no but um you know but this is a weak excuse for weak men yes absolutely i'm in agreement with you it's also poor logic as you could apply the same logic to almost anything by simply forgetting that yes it may just end up being some other guy, but it doesn't have to. At the very least, it doesn't have to be you. True. Um, I think we as men need to start holding ourselves and our fellow men to a much higher standard because as we see in female behavior in other realms, we get more of the behavior we enable. So here's another thing, right? Because I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the fuckboys. Legitimate fuckboys who don't ever want to get married, they don't give a shit. Do you know why? Because they're never going to have to come back around and say, wait, wait, I want to get married. They're just going to keep being fuckboys, which is why they don't care. But women who are being, you know, they're sleeping around and stuff, those girls are the ones that are going to say, wait, wait, come back. And that's where they get screwed. So I always say this. If you're a girl or a guy and you live a casual lifestyle, including this stuff you described, if you're not planning to get married, it's never going to come to bite you in the ass. However, home wrecking is it morally reprehensible? In my opinion, yes, it is. But again... Just from a cost-benefit analysis, do these people care if they're never planning to ask for the LTR? No, because they could just go get another STR tomorrow. They could just go to the other side of town where a bunch of people don't know about the thing that they did, and then bam, they're good as new. Especially with online dating, anonymity is so easy, which is why you're seeing this behavior, for sure. So, of course, you know, again, when you have a man, though, that tries to you know, live that life. And then once again, I think Rush V had a situation like that where he wanted to be like in the, the spiritual marriage and stuff. And women were like pushing him away because of his past. Again, that's life holding you accountable. And I don't feel bad for you if you're trying to have your cake and eat it too. It doesn't matter what your anatomy is. People in general who dodge responsibility and try to have their cake and eat it too, I don't like them. 
You don't have to have female body parts for me to feel that way about it. It's not a prerequisite, for sure. Um, but you just have to understand on the same token, men who are never looking to get married, they really don't care about your this moral grandstanding. They, they just don't care because they know they're never going to ask for marriage. They're never going to have to qualify for an LTR because the only thing they're trying to get is STR. They're fast life mating strategists. They don't care. Um, I am already seeing more people calling out OnlyFans simps and the like, but we need to go further. This is good. Yes, I don't think you should be paying. You should be paying for freaking clips and things like this on the regular. No, you shouldn't because it's on there for free, bro. Like, why are you paying? It doesn't make sense. Um, and then it's like, oh, well, they pay for the the tailored experience well again that's her monopolizing on your loneliness you want to enable that i agree you gotta like shit on that too but men need to embrace integrity and stop shrugging their shoulders at dirt bag behavior what are your thoughts well again the reality is this right i tend to shrug my shoulders if the person in question is engaging in the behavior and they're not going to ask for the good outcome when they like in other words the bad no the good output when they had bad inputs you know what i mean so if as long as they don't try to like have their cake and eat it too <coughs> i'm usually like it's not my business that's men or women you know as long as you're as long as you're not trying to have your cake and eat it too but if you're trying to have your cake and eat it too and sell it to me like you're the good guy or the good girl i'm gonna look at you like you're an asshole and I will totally just tear into you, for sure. But if it's like, yo, you know who you are and whatever, yeah, in the back of my head, I'm judging you. I think you're a piece of shit. But, um, you know, well, what, what am I going to do if I have two consensual adults that are, that are totally okay with that? Like, like what am I going to do? You know, I'm just finger wagging at people who don't care. But um, also, has your girlfriend ever fixed you plop for dinner? Yes. Um, if so, what'd you think of it? It was pretty good. I mean, it's something that definitely she grew up on. Um, but, um, from what I had, you know, it was, it was good food. Krellian. Hey Pete. So my dad passed recently. Sorry for your loss. He ended up leaving me some money. Not an insane amount, but more than I was expecting. I've been pretty lost in life. Four out of 10 looks. At least you passed the looks test. Need to bust my ass to get to five. Just turned 40. No dating prospects currently. I was in Western North Carolina during Hurricane Helene. Jesus. Sorry to hear that, man. I hope that, you know, everything is relatively normal now. And left the area to stay with relatives. Okay. The town I resided in got destroyed. Oof. My job is slowly coming back, but it's tourism-based, so it will be slow. I also suffer from intestinal health problems. Feels like it's only a matter of time till I end up in surgery again, or perhaps the health issues will just end my life outright, or maybe nothing happens. I'm debating what to do with the money. Keep it in savings or use it to travel the world, which I've always wanted to do. Perhaps Geomax as well. Um, finally, sleep with some hot women overseas, maybe. Maybe that sounds like an immature attitude for a 40-year-old, but I've been largely denied that life experience. I mean, that's fine, but I would say probably, again, Usually what you do is you save a portion and you spend a portion, right? So the question is, okay, um, how much are you looking to spend to travel? Um, realistically, like what's the cheapest you could do it for? And then can you afford to keep the rest in savings or investment accounts and things like this so that you can make money off your money? Usually whenever you come by an inheritance or something like that, you want to make that money work for you. You want to, like my personal, because I'm risk averse as fuck. So me, I like to pretend the money doesn't even exist. That's what I like to do. Pretend it doesn't exist and just let it grow. That's what I do. Some people though, again, they're more, more along the lines of your perspective, where it's like, hey, um, no, I want to spend some of it on like, travel and things like that. That's fine, but definitely don't spend it all on travel. Invest some. If we're talking like over $100,000 here, I would say probably having $100,000 in an investment account would be good because once you hit that $100,000, the first $100,000 is always difficult to hit. So if you're already in a luxurious position where you have that, let that hundred grand work for you, right? Think about it. If the market gives you, let's say, a 5% return, 
Um, and my experience, it averages like 8%, but let's say it's 5% to be hyper conservative. That's $5,000 you just made doing nothing. You know what I mean? So, and then obviously as the, the account balance gets bigger and bigger and bigger over time, you know, yeah, the market has ups and downs. Generally, if you're more conservative with your investments, the ups and downs are, you know, more flat. While if you're aggressive, it's more like this. While if you're moderate, it's more like, you know, just chilling. With net aggregate, it's going up. <coughs> so those investments are, you know, definitely something that can help you. That's probably what I would do with the money is invest it. I'm always looking to make money off my money. And then basically whatever I make from my job, yeah, save some of that. But if I have some disposable income, yeah, I put that towards vacations. That's kind of what I do personally. Um, but if you're if you're committed to the idea of blowing some of the money, I would say definitely do not do it with the lion's share of the money. Um, definitely do it with a minority share, and the lion's share should be invested in some capacity. You should be making money, whether it's a brokerage account, whether it's a high yield savings account, something like this for sure. But I totally empathize with the idea. You know, eh, take a few thousand dollars. Go to Southeast Asia, you know, get it out of your system and stuff like this. Do it responsibly. You don't want to come back with anything, right? Um, but, you know, other than that, I don't really blame you for your mindset, uh, but I just wouldn't recommend burning through all the money. That's all. So, yeah, in your situation, I probably would put a heavier focus on saving money for sure, um, but a minority focus would be on using the money for pleasure. And if you want to do that, I'm sure, you know, if he left you a sizable amount, you could probably afford to take a minority share and enjoy it and take a majority share and invest it. That's what I would do. Romanian Turk. Hey, Pete, should I believe what women say? No. <laughs> Watch what they do. Visnok. Hey, Pete, do you believe there's such a thing as a name cell? I find it weird that men in these circles have explored every aspect of male attractiveness from career path down to the third decimal of the angle of the cheekbones, yet I can hardly recall seeing any discussion about names. A name is not only your brand outwards, but also how you refer to yourself inwards. I think it has a huge impact on people's lives, especially for those with a lot of trauma associated with hearing their name, or those who constantly get it misheard, misspelled, and misremembered. I changed mine earlier this year in anticipation of starting a new life in El Salvador, and it gave me confidence and a big grin on my face from the day I got it approved. Now I'm Flo Main, which, <laughs> which speaks to my long and beautiful hair and gives me a leg up in the rap game. <laughs> what are you, a mumble rapper? Hey man, yo, fucking Flo Main, man. <laughs> uh, people seem to love it. It sparks their curiosity as well. What are some boys and girls' names you'd want to give your kids should you have them? Now, what about some names to set them up for failure? I'd like to hear your thoughts on this topic. Um, so, I do believe something like a name cell does exist, for sure, absolutely. Um, in job interviews, depending on what your last name is, they might bust your balls, right? Um, so, definitely, I think there is something like a name cell. Like, if you have, like, a fucking shitty-ass name, um, yeah, women might be like, nah, that's bad stock, I'm good. Um, but it's definitely not at the top of the list of reasons for ick. But it definitely can give ick, for sure. Um, if I were to name my kids, I think for my son, I'd probably name him Jack. Just something like just Jack. Um, daughter? Daughter, I don't know. I never really thought about it, to be honest. Because if I wanted a kid, I'd want a son. <laughs> daughter i'd be too scared to have a daughter there's just so much that can go wrong with raising a daughter and it's not even your fault man it's just like yo when they get exposed to all that attention man it's just so easy for them to become thoughts it's scary man so i haven't really thought about a daughter's name to be honest sorry i just can't think of anything lord of iron okay pd pudding pop <laughs> sounds like bill cosby Petey pudding pop <laughs> jello pudding <laughs> So I've been following Andrew Wilson on X. Yeah, I think I know who that is. And various debate discussion videos for a lot for a hot minute now. Personally, I think he's becoming quite the powerhouse when it comes to unveiling the trending Christian women group. Yeah, of course, man. They 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 fucking live life being thoughts and then they want to say they found Jesus. Dude, nobody's buying that shit. Even like in the Muslim community, they have something called the hojabi. It's like, bro, we're not buying it. <laughs> you know? It's like, I sometimes I think women think like men are stupid. Like they really think we're dumb, but we're not. 
you know, we, we just don't tell you we're not looking for the LTR because we want to get the STR out of you. And that's why you end up getting ghosted for the 50th time. But yeah, the Christian woman Griff that's infiltrated the churches or other traditional spaces. Not to mention he appears to be one of the few Christian figures who actually holds women's feet to the fire and doesn't hold men to the same hold men to some false biblical standard where literally everything is their fault. Yeah. I do notice that a lot of churches, they're just like reinforcing women and blaming men for everything, which is total bullshit. Um, in the family unit, there are duties for both the men and the women, and they have to work together. Teamwork makes the dream work and all that. And yeah, I do notice a lot of like these pushover pastors who just sort of bend over backwards for the punani, and it's, just, it's weak. It's embarrassing. Besides the whatever podcast, have you seen him engage feminists on X at all? I haven't. If so, what's your take on his approach and its effectiveness in revealing just how deep feminist infiltration has gotten, even in the church? It's definitely effective. I just think women don't care because what they feel like supersedes everything else. Uh, but yeah, I do get a kick out of his interactions with um, you know, the, the people on the whatever podcast, man, because he really holds them accountable and then the girls break or they just go silent. But then here's the thing. They just go back out into the world and continue their thought shenanigans. I don't think Andrew's getting through, to be honest. Um, like, sadly, we live in a world where, like, bad things have to happen to you, whether it's just, like, getting just brutally ghosted over and over and over again, or you get cheated on, or, or like, something like that has to happen to you just for you to be like, oh, okay. And for women, it's like doubly true because it's just they're so indoctrinated and they think they're the best things in sliced bread. Robo Garda says, just a thought at its core, rejection from women is a rejection of one's genetics. That is correct. I understand your point that there are other things that guys can pursue in life, but I'm finding this particular black pill a very hard one to swallow. Sounds like nihilistic valley. It's like I'm always reminded of it eventually. Sure. But the reminder won't hurt as much if you genuinely accept, which I, I get it. It's hard to get out of that nihilistic valley, but you just have to like re really just not give a fuck, man. Like honestly, like I've uh, women's opinions about me in particular, I, I just stopped giving a shit. I just I just don't care at all. Like they could say whatever they want, I don't care. Even my own girlfriend gets annoyed sometimes because, because <laughs> I'm such a savage, bro. Like she'll point out things and, I'll, and like that maybe she doesn't like, and I'll be like, "This is who I am, bro." Like, and she'll just roll her eyes. And I'm like, "Dude, it is what it is. If you're hoping for change, you're gonna be disappointed." <coughs> you know, but again, I keep the same energy in the other direction. I accept her for who she is too, and like that's how you have to kind of be. It's like, hey, you got to accept that this is what it is, and that's it. And you know, whatever. You know, and you have to, you have to have the balls to stand by it. You can't fold for Punani or anything like that. You got to stand by it. Stick to your guns. But anyway, the worst thing that I see, the logic, nature is not going to reward poor genetics. That's true. The suffering is therefore not because of depression, but nature reminding you of your place. That's also true. And it will never let one forget. That is also true. Correct. Um, I do definitely think, though, that we have a problem in modern society, especially sometimes in this space, where people either underestimate internal locus of control versus external locus, or they overestimate external versus internal. A lot of people do that. And again, the people who tend to hold the view that everything is external, they're going to roll their eyes at this statement, um, while the toxically positive people would think the opposite, that everything is internal. You can control everything. Those people are fucking delulu um but at the end of the day um in the pecking order you're probably not as low on the pecking order as you think you are but the average guy um in comparison to the average woman and chads yeah w w we're not anywhere near that level on the pecking order and it sucks it absolutely does suck and it is difficult to accept that by and large a majority of women probably statistically 80 percent of women are not going to find you attractive if you're an average guy. And obviously, the closer to sub five you get, the higher that percentage gets. Yes, that's hard to accept. And really, it's like, okay, well, that's an external locus of control factor. I can't control how these women feel about me. But at the end of the day, I do have this whole life ahead of me as well. So what am I going to do with it? And again, most of the time, what are you doing? You're sleeping, 
you're working and then you're just having hobbies and other things copes basically to deal with the last third and that's basically what you're doing um but another thing also is to again go to places that showcase your interests even if you don't find women maybe you might make friends you know um my uncle his his wife died of cancer um and that that was really hard on him but what he started doing is he started going to meetups and like hanging out with people and just and just you know just shooting the shit and it's like that that's kind of what you have to do a lot too because we are a pro social species and thankfully um while genetics definitely plays a big role in mate selection it's not as harsh with friendships um so there is that all the pills hey pete i'm curious about something if you and your partner for some reason happened to break up do you think that you would be done dating forever so the short answer to this question is yes i would this this is it this is it if she changes her mind and goes her own way um i'm gonna have to accept that <clears throat> and after that yeah i'm probably not gonna do it again yeah that that's probably just as clear cut as it gets unknown infinium what's up pete how you doing man i'm doing all right my question is why'd you steal my girl i didn't mean to bro shit happens take care dude happy to see you prayers to you and your family thanks man an empty shell what's good pete finally caught one of these again my question is related to what we talked about via email i went digging deep this last week and did some introspection on where my goals and my recent desire to change things in my life comes from what I came up with, surprisingly, is that it's all based on insecurity, and I mean all the way down. That is to say, there is not a single goal I can name which doesn't have the approval of or admiration by other people tied up in it somehow. Be it improving my physique, <clears throat> becoming more competent in my field, or just becoming more disciplined in general. It's like on some level I subconsciously believe that being me is unacceptable in the eyes of others. It kind of came as a shock since I never really regarded myself as particularly insecure. So my question, how do you get over such an insecurity? Blindly chasing those goals anyways won't matter since their actual fulfillment hinges on the reactions of other people. Achieving anything out of insecurity won't make that insecurity go away. It will just move the goalpost. We know this. I just have no idea how to find those things that I myself want to do for my own sake, you know? Yeah, I get it. Um, I think one of the one of the revelations i had a while back was you know your life is kind of like a train right that train has many stops people get on the train people get off the train but there's one person that's going to stay on that train the whole time and that's going to be you right and the last stop is the graveyard pretty much so the question becomes when you get to that stop and you look back at the journey this train has been on are you going to look at it and say like, you know, I really got to do what I wanted to do? Or is it going to be like, you know, there's a lot of shit I really wanted to do that I never got around to. It always boils down to that because it's very interesting. You know, another saying I heard is, you know, if you have to make a decision, flip a coin. Because the interesting thing is once that coin is spinning in the air, all of a sudden you know what the answer is, what you want. Because you're hoping it lands on the side you want. So in that regard... You know, I would say you definitely have to stop giving a shit what other people think, as cliche as that sounds, because these people are probably not going to be in your life even a year from now, a lot of them. So you have to accept that their opinions really don't matter, okay? This is your life, your genetics, your environment, your mix. This is yours. <clears throat> now, you can argue that this insecurity by in part is genetic or environmental, or anything like this. But I know that if you're this introspective, you definitely have the capacity to be secure in who you are as much as you have the capacity to be insecure. So with that being said, priority one is acknowledging that catering to what other people want is going to drain your energy because all you're going to be trying to do is appease, 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 appease. And you're going to feel this energy drain because you're not doing anything that nurtures yourself or what you want out of life. And therefore, nothing's going to feel fulfilling whatsoever. And as a result of that, it's just going to leave you feeling like an empty husk. 
So you have to get it out of your head that appeasing others equals psychological security. It does not. Being confident in what it is you want out of life, pursuing that goal because you know you want it, and succeeding in that goal, and doing that again and again and again, that's what creates confidence and competence and security. So you have to have that paradigm shift where it's like, fuck what's going on outside of me, because there's no guarantee accomplishing these goals will even appease them long term anyway. And focus on internally what's going to appease you. You're noticing a theme with this Q&A. It's all internal. You have to focus on you know what's going on in your own warehouse. Take inventory. Figure out what you need to get in stock and what you need to take off the shelf, etc., etc. So you have to just figure out. I would recommend sit down with a pen and paper and just write down like, hey, what are the top five things that you're looking for in life? And then once you have those top five things, then maybe start looking into research on how to attain those five things and work on them one at a time from the most um, most important one to the least important one. An alternative would be to go from what you perceive to be the easiest one to get, to get a positive Matthew effect loop going and work your way up to the most difficult one. Because as you keep succeeding, that's going to motivate you to take on the bigger beast. Journaling in general might also be an effective thing too just to monitor your progress and see how far you've come. You'd be surprised how if you journal every day, you look back two months just to see how you sounded two months ago and you look at yourself two months later, you're like, wow, there is some growth. But sometimes we don't document that growth so we don't really see it. I know for me, YouTube videos doing this, it's helped me kind of really see my progression. And that I I think definitely made me a lot more secure in who I was. This has kind of been like a therapeutic journal for me as much as it's been a conversation for you all as well. On a lighter note, have you played Cyberpunk 2077? If so, what are your thoughts on it? I finished it recently and was disappointed with it. I personally have not played it because I heard it was pretty bad when it launched. It had been hyped up so much online after the big post-launch fix, but I felt that the combat was annoying to play and the world, however well-designed it may be artistically, felt empty and shallow. A lot of open worlds fall victim to this samey looking npcs that don't do things buildings you cannot actually enter etc just felt like being on stage with a bunch of props to me as always appreciate that you haven't dipped on us yet have a good one yeah um i think grand theft auto is one of the series that actually does it right but given how long the development cycles are there's a reason that's the case rvcc are you an anti-natalist or just sympathetic to it i'm just sympathetic to it I understand it. I personally don't want kids, but I'm not inherently like, hey, nobody should have kids. No. Um, But I definitely empathize, I think is the more accurate term, with people who hold that position. How was your childhood, Pete? Any negative experiences? Any regrets? I mean, listen, what did I have going on? I mean, probably the big thing was my dad dying at 19. That was probably the big thing that fucked me up. Other than that, what am I dealing with? Yeah, I got bullied a little bit in high school, of course. Um, (laughs) I mean, look at me, right? And, you know, the rejections from girls. This is pretty run-of-the-mill shit. Other than that, I had a pretty normal childhood, right? Running around outside, playing with my friends, you know, sports, uh, Pokemon link cable battles, Yu-Gi-Oh! duels. Like, this is the stuff we grew up on. It was a much simpler time. And thankfully, I'm very fortunate that I did not have too many negative experiences. My negative experiences, again, can be summed up as being on the receiving end of bullying in high school, rejections from women, and my dad dying. Which, none of that is really, like, um, you know, unexpected. These are expected life experiences that you're going to have, but it doesn't make them any less difficult to deal with in the moment. But then you get older, you look back on it, and you're like, you know what? I'm stronger because of it, so I'm okay. I don't really have any regrets. If I were to identify one though where like something close to a regret is that maybe I would have done the CPA sooner. Like I would have stuck to my accounting degree, got that at age 21, got the CPA at 21 and had more years under my belt. But in retrospect, I still turned out okay. So I can't really call it a regret. But after watching ex-convict testimonies, I finally realized one crucial social mistake. ex con stated any disrespect must be met with violence. While I was raised to turn the other cheek, and I feared that I'd be punished if I behaved that way. Plus, I was a sickly kid with no malice and trauma from circumcision for babies, mutilated, tortured, developed PTSD. Mm. 
Yeah. So, I tend to agree with this, but not to the point where you have to necessarily be violent. But you have to exercise backbone, have self-respect, and speak. And then if the other person threatens you and tries to throw hands, well, now you got to defend yourself. And yes, then you would have to use it. Um, otherwise, no. Now, convicts get punished too, but they know that their entire stay will be hell if they do nothing, such is the case in school. Most children are evil because they don't know better. Exceptions seem to be the intellectually gifted or neurodivergent, such as Asperger's, including ASPD monsters. Uh, they operate under the violent, antisocial, and unethical Ugabuga dominance hierarchy, and thugs merely double down on it due to genetics and or environment. It is present to many adults, but suppressed. Of course, the caveman is in all of us. I remembered an annoying kid similar to e-celeb streamers like Neon, Johnny Somali, Jack Doherty, etc. that would insult everyone in his class that he viewed as easy targets and threatened to snitch on anyone that retaliated to teachers and on his older brother. Reminiscent of the modern zeitgeist where self-defense is vilified and instigators, aggressors, or victims that sometimes are even beloved, such as those e-celebs. I am not sure why so many like such people that behave in such a manner. Um, because some people are very good at putting on a fake public image. Uh, that's really what it is. But I also remember disrespect escalating to the point of physical assault until I finally snapped, fought back, and finally won. Probably felt good, didn't it? Drastically reducing the physical attacks, but the damage was done socially. Later on, the stakes were too high to act in this matter, especially now in the adult world, when men must endure unforgivable abuse by those above us. There's another one with self-defense. Don't apologize for that. I also have regrets about monetary investments I could have made. Had no income when Bitcoin was dirt cheap, but I could have dropped out of my studies and gotten a job or a loan if I knew the future. <laughs> yeah, right? Hindsight's 2020. And optimizing my biology, such as increasing height, physical appearance, and intellect by proper medication instead of the medical malpractice I endured, taking drugs like growth hormone, aromatose inhibitors, estrogen reduction to prevent growth plate closure, and maybe hopefully get a horse-sized wing week. High protein nutrition, orthodontic treatment that my parents failed to do. Not of malice, but out of ignorance that I paid for dearly. I forgave them since it was not out of malicious purpose, but the problems remain so there is always some resentment. 99.9% .9 of parents lack the empathy, intelligence, and wisdom to set up their children for biological success. They don't even do DNA testing or investigate if family members of the spouse are sickly or not, and even pay to have their sons destroyed by circumcision for they do not think for themselves, leaving the thinking to the authorities, which is why tyrants love to lower the IQ of the population and are actively doing this. Ignoring that in a post-industrial society, a low IQ population is a burden, yes, for they are intellectually disabled in such a technologically advanced society. Yes, we're even seeing that now. Just so many dumb motherfuckers walking around. Reproduction is idiotic. If it was purely a rational decision, none of it would do as Arthur Schopenhauer brilliant stated. Only bad decisions were made in my life, and it seems inevitable to continue making bad decisions with permanent consequences because we do not know the future. How can anyone cope with such injustice? Well, again, as someone else pointed out, fair world fallacy. Who says the world has to be fair? Who says? You know? So, again, the notion that there, there has to be a fair world is what makes it so difficult to deal with it because you think the world has to be just. It would be nice if the world was just, but unfortunately it is not. If all men knew women only like tall and handsome men... Now, oh, if all men knew that, most men give up on bullying other men, acquiring money and status above the minimum necessary. Mm -hmm. No, because again, it's, bake, it's baked into the, the psyche to, um, again, do, climb the dominance hierarchy and get punani. So a lot of men, they kind of give into that. <clears throat> Very hard to have the self-awareness um, to sort of um, sidestep that and be a better person. More lighthearted questions. Favorite movies, series, TV, or anime? Video games that you loved experience and video games you can play nearly forever if you could. Favorite movies? Um, I like the John Wick movies. I like the Matrix movies. <clears throat> I like Watchmen. That's a good movie. Um, television series? I do like Man in the High Castle. I like that show. Vikings is good. Um, South Park, of course. Good comedy. Can't argue with that. Anime? Um... Mm, I can't really think of like a specific anime that was because again I haven't watched anime in a long time um, video games um, I loved experiencing and video games you could play forever if you could probably my favorite video game series of all time is Mass Effect 
So I could probably play that forever. <laughs> um, Halo, I like Halo. Um, I like Shin Megami Tensei, the whole series, and all the sub-series. Um, I like Metal Gear. <clears throat> I like Gears of War, so there's a few. Anyone in your personal life know about your channel? Yeah, they all know, and they don't give a shit. <laughs> Do SSRIs cause brain fog or any cognitive impairment, or has the opposite occurred? For me personally, the opposite has occurred, um, because I'm not anxious as much. I never find other men you could discuss anything of gravity or negative topics with, such as yourself. So I can grow in understanding and figure out the truth, no matter the negative feelings that come about. Thank you. You're welcome. I think most people, they just, again, in an increasingly toxically positive world, it's like you're not allowed to just have a moment, you know? You're not allowed to just kind of like sit with the negative and process it. But it's, I think it's important because we, pr we can prevent things like self-deletion if we can actually sit down and talk these things out. Alan Chadwick. Hey Pete, thanks for all the email support throughout this year and especially for your last video. The advice you gave back in August was a real lifesaver. I'm finally on a better path, nearly a month alcohol free, walking daily and giving my best at work. I genuinely enjoy my job now and feel like I found an improved routine. Good shit. On weekdays, I got a handle on things, but weekends without plans are tough. Oh dude, sitting around with fucking nothing to do. <clears throat> yeah. I hear you, brother. Because <laughs> it gives you time to ruminate. I tend to feel down and unhealthy habits creep back in. The inkwell stuff still sucks, as you know. But I'm working on moving out of that depression mode and focusing on progress over perfection. Yes, perfection is something we can aspire to but will never attain. Honestly, I didn't realize how much alcohol was affecting me until I saw a recent picture. Four years ago, I was half the size I am now, and I can barely see my own dick anymore. The weight gain is frustrating. Yeah, the beer gut, man. Oof. But it's something I can control, and I'm grateful for that. I used to box, so I've got some muscle underneath, but being overweight is no fun. Correct. Gotta work on that. You seem to have reached a place where you don't get depressed as much anymore. I think it's because you've put in the work and developed emotional resilience. Oh, yes. Like I said, it's like, you you really have to accept it's not fair that like you really have, like i think a lot of people again they just feel these negative emotions because internally they're still pushing back with this notion that there should be fairness in the world and it's just like there isn't it just is what it is i'm starting to understand that depression for me was just freezing a loss of hope so now i'm focusing on gratitude staying busy and setting goals how do you deal with depression what does your therapist advise well the thing is everybody's different right um, but I find I find joy in my work, for sure. Um, always learning new information, getting more knowledgeable, etc., etc. Um, and then on my downtime, again, if I'm not hanging out with my girlfriend doing something, I'll probably be just playing a video game. That's not that that's just the honest truth, and it works for me. But quitting alcohol hasn't been too hard, but giving up corn is a different story. I mean, listen, you're not in a relationship. So as long as, like, again, you're not, like, abusing it to the point where it's, like, you're doing it, like, fucking, I don't know, three, four, five, six times a day. I've heard guys who do it like that. You know, you're probably fine, man. Um, you know, I can't say I blame you. You still have a biological need, right? You got to keep it. You got to keep the tank empty. Um, but it's been 10 years since I had a relationship. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I'll get out of it. That's the only thing I'm truly hopeless about because I never meet girls, and if I do, they're taken or I receive F-off signals. I'm trying to improve myself, looks Max, but the lack of a social circle makes it hard. Still, your video, the emotional competency website, and attending AI uh, Anon meetings have all helped me gain awareness, acceptance, and action. I know I've made mistakes, and this year has been challenging, but like you always say, no one's going to do the work for me or help me. And that's true. When you're a man, you're completely on your own. Nobody gives a fuck. Um, but I wouldn't beat yourself up over the, the corn thing too much, man. You know, like I said, single guys, like, I get it, man. I get it. Man's got needs. I was curious. Have you ever done Alcoholics Anonymous? No. Alcoholics Anonymous has, I realize it's not AI Anon, it's Alcohol Anonymous, my bad, has been helpful for me in understanding my family dynamics, particularly my dad's alcoholism. I think therapy was the substitute for me. But it follows a similar 12-step program, but the focus is on not letting the behavior of others control me. Correct. 
Uh, like I said to the other person, these people are not going to be in your life forever, so why should they have any say? It's about taking responsibility for myself and remembering the serenity prayer. Correct. This Basically, this prayer is internal locus versus external locus and understanding the difference. That's basically what this prayer is. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, external locus, courage to change the things I can, internal locus, and the wisdom to know the difference, acceptance. I'm also finding wisdom in phrases like keep it simple, first things first, and one day at a time. I'm trying to stay committed to a long-term change, but I know it could be hard to maintain. How do you keep up the momentum over the months and years, especially when life throws curveballs, for example, with alcohol or corn addiction? Um, you know, honestly, man, you just life is one of those things where there always are going to be curveballs, and as long as you don't have like expectations that it's supposed to be a certain way or notions of what fairness is and stuff like that, and you legitimately accept, it gets a little easier to deal with it. Because when shit happens, it's like, well, in the realm of possibility, yeah, this could happen. It wasn't completely unexpected. Okay, so now let's look into how we can actually solve this shit. And let's worry about what I can actually do to fix the problem. And anything I can't do, I'll either find someone who can do something or accept that nobody could do anything about this and we just got to let it go. <clears throat> you know? Um, so leaning on crutches like booze, obviously, is not going to solve the problem. So understanding that intrinsically makes it a little easier to not come back to that crutch. But growing up with an alcoholic parent, I think contributed a lot to my issues. People pleasing, depression, anxiety, and even my own struggles with booze. The adult child of an alcoholic's laundry list fits me too well. But I'm working to unlearn those behaviors. As I mentioned before, I bought my own house just outside of London, so I'm doing well in career and financially. I'm looking forward to the change. Nice. I know I told you about my mom's long affair, and I've decided to forgive her and move on. Do you have any thoughts on forgiveness, even revenge in some cases? Um, <clears throat> I would say honestly, man, I don't really would use the word forgiveness. It's more accept that it happened, but never forget. That's kind of my take. Um, for me, that's kind of hard to forgive. And, like, they have to understand that, like, what they did was really, really fucked up. Because sometimes forgiveness can be enabling. That's just my take. But I don't think revenge solves anything, too. I don't think it solves anything. But I used to hold grudges, but now I feel like minding my own business and focusing on my own world is best. That's probably better, honestly. But if you're a psycho, revenge seems to make one angry. Yeah. Final note, I'm trying to keep my focus internal. While I think a lot of incels lean too heavily on external factors like social media or politics as reasons for their problems, I don't want to fall into that trap. I see average guys with great partners, and I'm starting to think some of the extreme claims, like 60% of men are single, again, specifically between ages 18 and 30. If you include everyone, it's more like I think half or like right below half. Um, but many more men than women, and it's all about looks aren't as accurate as they seem. Again, when you go outside, warm approach, you have the opportunity to showcase things other than your looks. So if you have those opportunities, like going to places that showcase your interests, yes, your odds do improve. Absolutely. Um, but if you rely on the internet to find a girl, that's where things get rough. Uh, and it's, yeah. Am I right or wrong there? So again, you're right in that non-physical attributes matter. Uh, wrong in the sense that what you see around you overrides the fact that there's a basic looks test. There's always a basic looks test, but every girl's different, right? But if in, your, in her head you're at least passing the looks test, which we define as a 4 out of 10, normie light, then you can kind of talk your way into generating attraction and desire, theoretically. Thomas White, Martin Goldberg, Hell by the Dashboard, Tales and other YouTubers in the Black Pill sphere tend to have narc personalities or Asperger's. When I leave the house, my eyes disprove their theories. Again, a lot of their theories, like in the purest sense, would be online dating. But again, there are some black pills that cannot be denied, which is there is a basic looks test, period. There is. That will never be deniable in my opinion. I'm rambling. Anyways, thanks again. Genuinely grateful for your advice. It hasn't gone unheard. I'm trying my best. Keep up the good work, man. All the best. The Ghost. 
Hope you're doing well, Pete. I want to start by saying that I no longer watch black pill videos to the same extent I did back in the days, and I feel like most of my friends are in the same boat. I feel like we've touched on most relevant topics in this sphere, and we all agree, granted to different degrees, that looks are the most important factor in determining outcomes as human beings in most intersexual interactions. Yes, it's the difference between being desired, being a friend, or being told to screw off, harassment claims, etc., etc. With that said, I was wondering if it would be okay for me to download all videos in your channel and have backup offline and or online in case YouTube casts a censorship spell on you. Yeah, I already said that's okay. Asking because I found your channel to be very informative and balanced at the same time and found your delivery to be delicate and efficient in driving the message home. That is what I was going for, a balance. I think a lot of young men could benefit from your channel in the long run for many, many years to come. I also think that teaching men that driving to Home Depot to get a rope is usually not the best answer in life. Agreed. It is a very honorable message that commands respect in itself. Yeah, you know, because I, I, sometimes I think, you know, a lot of these men who are thinking about roping or they go through with it, it's just if the correct circumstances presented themselves to these people, they might either reconsider or they might have not done it. And then there could have been other things that they could have got out of life. But, you know, you never know for sure. But by having a channel like this, you hope that it does help some guys so that they steer away from that direction. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope life is going well for you. For myself, I've had many surgeries since I found the black pill and made substantial improvements to my looks, which in turn made my life infinitely easier and more enjoyable. Best decision of my life, hands down. <clears throat> I think I finally reached an acceptance state. I have a very peaceful life surrounded by my family and friends. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I know that I'm going to be okay. And that's really all you can hope for at the end of the day, that you're going to be okay. Take care, man. Been a pleasure watching your videos for so many years. Particularly enjoyed these weekly interactive streams that you once hosted on here. Almost felt like therapy at times. I mean, yeah, th that's kind of a secondary effect. It's just kind of give you a place, you know? Like, we did the channel where we covered all the topics, as you said, like most of the topics. Yeah, you get new terminology here and there, like, what's an ick? But we've talked about things like that in different words. So we're kind of at this point now where I've kind of gotten your opinions on things with my subscribers. What do you think videos? I've talked about what I think about a lot of things. So we kind of just have like this support system where once a month we put together a Q&A. And it kind of gives you a space. And, you know, some people, they email me like some have mentioned here. And I try to help out when I can, um, hoping I make a difference, you know. So that's really all you can do. You just hope you make a dent. Jordan Troy, hi Pete. Any tips on becoming an effective communicator? I'm in sales, so appreciate any pointers. As I mentioned earlier, when it comes to something like sales, right, it's all about matching what your offering is to the needs of the prospect. So again, it's important to be a good listener. Communicating isn't just about talking, it's about listening. So you have to be able to listen to what the desires, aka the demand of the client or prospect, whatever you want to call them, is so that you can match the supply with your offering, right? So usually for me, when I have like re um, referrals, right, it's usually like, okay, so you just formed a business because my firm specializes in small business. Okay, so you formed a small business. Okay, uh, what are your objectives here? Legally, what are your objectives? Tax-wise, what are your objectives? Um, you know, what are your questions? Let's focus on what matters to you first. <clears throat> Get a good checklist. And then I'll talk about some things that might be important. <clears throat> and then after you cover all that, you probably by then got to feel, okay, does this person need taxes? Does this person need bookkeeping and accounting? Does this person need payroll or some other type of service? Um, and based on that, I kind of put together a custom offering that basically mirrors their needs and I say okay based on what you're asking yeah we could do that for you and this is how the offering looks this is what you get in the offering does that sound like something that would be of interest to you and then usually I leave the door open you know um, and then most of the time they get back to me within like a week or so and then they I close the deal <clears throat> but I would say the key component in sales is being very aware 
of what the demand of the prospect is and then mirroring that demand with your supply, what your offering is. Also, outcome detachment. I lost a deal earlier this year and I did a poor job and still losing sleep over it. Yeah, I mean, listen, I have situations where I failed too and that imposter syndrome really sets in and it can sometimes really cripple you, but you kind of just have to lick your wounds, get up and just and just go to the next one. Sales is a numbers game, right? You're just going in over and over and over and over again. <laughs> when I first started at this firm, I started in sales. But then they realized I was a nerd and they started letting me do actual tax work and then it kind of went from there. But really what it boils down to, again, is matching supply with demand. You're smart, Pete, so I can dig deeper for context. I got a promotion back in April. Within my first week, my dream lead came in from marketing. We never get inbounds. A perfect fit customer approached us with the ambition to replace their existing system, who happens to be our arch nemesis. Bear in mind, I never had training or anything. I have been purely fueled by my youth and fire. Long story short, I did a discovery call did a demo a few weeks after, and it was 60 minutes of content, no context. I didn't learn anything about them, their plan, their pains or decision criteria, and the demo didn't do justice about our product. I received a poor response email from them a few weeks after that demo. Glad to say I've learned about sales strategies and tactics since improved a lot since, but I still get upset by this lead loss deal. Don't let the losers diminish the winners. In fact, to become a winner, you sometimes have to be a loser. That's just the reality. To be successful, you have to know failure. Because if you don't know failure, you don't know the causes of failure. If you don't know the causes of failure, you don't know how to avoid failure. Right? Very much like, you know, what we do at Red Pill, right? If you don't know how girls think and so on, then you don't know the pitfalls to avoid. You don't know anything. Um, So these things are important. But again, this is a perfect example, right? The content is important, matching the supply to that. But again, the context, you have to be personable. You have to be personable with people because again, you have to you have to build that goodwill and trust. Like otherwise you're just some random schmuck I'm talking on the phone with. You have to definitely be you have to sound human when you talk on the phone. And that's definitely something that they no doubt taught you. Okay, so that was the last one. I'm going to refresh One more time, let's take a look. Do we have another question that got squeezed in? It doesn't look like we do. So yeah, I know as I kind of do these things off the cuff, sometimes it can feel like I'm just rambling, so I apologize in advance if there was any rambling. But a lot of these comments were very thoughtful, lengthy, thought out, etc. So naturally, you're just trying to take it apart piece by piece. And that sometimes results in a dragged out answer. So apologies in advance if you found that annoying. But in the meantime, if you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you did not, leave a dislike. Uh, If you would like the channel, subscribe, support, whatever you can. Um, But I don't take it personally. As long as you get your information somewhere, it's cool with me. At the end of the day, we are here for the purposes of preventing self-deletion, giving you an archive of information that can hopefully help you make more informed decisions in terms of how you interact in the world, in particular with intersex relations, but a little bit beyond that as well. And also, ladies, if you're watching, I hope you're learning something about the male experience as well, because contrary to popular belief, we are not the same. Our experiences are drastically different from yours, Um, and there's a lot of suffering and silence. So hopefully you get some insight into that and flex the empathy muscle a little bit more as you learn. As always, I am that guy, Pete, that you refuse to invite to gatherings. I'll catch you for the next one, but for now, I'm going to head on out. Y'all take care, and you have a good night. Bye.